Um, thank you, Ian. <clears throat> so the first time I met Ian was at the Australian Research Council <coughs> when I presented the Airport of the Future proposal and Ian actually was working for the ARC. And on that day, the projector didn't work and a lot of pressure. And so I had to grab my little laptop, put it on the table, slightly inconvenient but still successful. Um, so I'm glad that we, from a technological viewpoint, made progress. So thank you so much for, for joining us this afternoon at prime time, Friday afternoon. Um, and, and again, also welcome everyone who joins us um, remotely. And, and that brings us to the topic of today, um, how we will exist, thrive, progress, accelerate in a dual world. Uh, so the notion of a dual world means we're living in a physical world, <clears throat> and this is what we are used to in the past, the physical world. Um, but then over time, the digital world emerged. Now the digital world, on the one side, helps us to progress in the physical world, uh, but if you go to any bus stop, it does also a massive, massive distraction <coughs> to your physical world. Uh, so I want to talk a lot about the idea of this kind of dual world paradigm. What are the implications? Um, and I'd like to propose today the notion of a digital mind to you. So the question is, how do we develop a mindfulness, a consciousness that is technologically agnostic and will hopefully survive for the next uh, years to come. And so to start this, um, I want to use a little example. Um, and this example um, comes from a local insurance company we interacted with. Um, and, and so they had this problem that I think one in four car accidents at the moment is caused by the use of a smartphone. Uh, that meant in the US in 2013, 4,500 fatal accidents. Now if you're a car insurer, one of your KPIs is to minimize the payout. Um, and so what they tried to work out, well, why all these in particular kids use their mobile phone? And so with a very technological mindset, the default answer was, surely we can build an app that recognizes that you drive, potentially immediately disables itself. And a bit like when you do random uh, breath testing um, in your car, your car will not start when you're drunk. The idea is, I could just disable using your phone while you drive and protect you. Now, when they went to their kids in those focus groups, every single driver said, what? What's the problem? There was a question, by the way. <laughs> um, so any, any idea what, 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 what does a 16 or 18 year old say? I appreciate your app, so you protect me. <laughs> OK, I realize this will be highly interactive this afternoon. Um, Yep, very good. Yep, so what they said is um, texting is not a problem at all. I like being engaged in the digital world. But when I was 16, one massive distraction entered my life. And this distraction was called driving. So I'm, I'm happily engaged in this kind of digital world, and all of a sudden this physical world becomes a massive distraction. <coughs> what do you mean you, you have to drive half an hour to work, an hour a day, five hours a week? Have you ever calculated the months in your life that you spent on driving? Isn't that a massive waste of time? So what they all said is, I want to have a car that takes care of driving for me, so I can engage in the digital world. If this means Angry Birds or mobile learning with QT is a different story, but please get a distraction out of my life. And what it shows you, um, a couple of things. First, when Google will be successful, we will see the biggest unlocking of human time we've ever seen on this planet. Um, so the value of unlocking this and to create truly the internet of the car drivers uh, will, will uh, truly have massive, massive impact. Second, when we approach innovation, we can have two viewpoints. We can look at the problem, we've got car accidents and it's a massive payout, or we can look at the opportunity, the driverless car. We are very good with problem-driven innovation we are very, very bad with opportunity-driven innovation. If it's true, the times are exponential, and in the future, there will be an oversupply of opportunities. We have to build systems, and this afternoon, I want to call them innovation systems, that help us to convert opportunities into solutions. I'll give you another example. <clears throat> we had Rio Tinto here two weeks ago, and I said, 
My boss went to uh, California, visited Google, came home with 10 Google Glasses. He put them on my desk and asked, them, asked me, what can Rio Tinto do with Google Glasses? Or what, what textbook, what methodology, what business process could I fire up that gives me the answer? But sadly, there's none for you. And so this is what shows you that in conversations we have, we are fascinated with problems because they're tangible and we can react. But innovation is driven by opportunities. And so innovation systems of the future have to work out how we translate opportunities. The ability to uh, analyze big data, robotics, 3D printing, uh, and the things we don't know today into solutions. If you're very small, you're an entrepreneur, you're driven by opportunities. You are big, Australia Post, Woolworths, or QET, you're driven by problems. Um, and so today we're going to talk about the digital mind and how it supports innovation in the future. Um, so for us, business process people, innovation is yet another process, a poorly supported process, and heavily relying on PowerPoint slides and, and Harvard Business Review articles. But I can't buy an innovation system off the shelf. And the SAPs and oracles of the world have limited ambition to build these systems. So if it's really true uh, that, that Peter Hawk and his friends will automate manual labor and systems will automate business processes, truly then we have to spend more attention and energy on change. And then so I see a massive research opportunity for the next 10 years to study innovation systems. In fact, I dropped the bomb this afternoon uh, to my colleagues in my school and said, what do you think about renaming information system school to innovation system school? Um, they still have to digest this, but I'm, I'm confident, yeah? Um, so, um, what is innovation? Well, innovation has got two facets. It really takes the idea to execution. So it's not just about the, the exciting part at the front bit, let's create something. It's the entire execution, yeah? The idea to, to, to implementation activity. Um, and the implementation needs to create some value. Rescuing lives in a hospital, <laughs> entertain you, give food to people who don't have food, or educate people on this planet. Um, and I want to talk a lot about how we innovate without creativity. So what we teach our students is a lot to think in a certain way that allows you to see innovation, that allows you to see solutions. If the outside world believes you're highly creative, but you're very conscious in your thinking, well, don't tell them. Um, and, and we have a true problem with innovation in Australia. So the uh, Innovation um, Efficiency Index, I think, ranks Australia on uh, number 81, which, believe it or not, is actually progression for last year. Um, and uh, it says that I think 46.6% of Australian organizations are innovation active. Yeah, you know, we talk about research activity. We also talk about innovation activity. And many of these innovation activities are horizon one, meaning you use what you've got to solve an existing problem. I could mention, let's say, email in the cloud. Uh, horizon two means you create complete new, uh, you, you take existing solutions and create some new uh, environments. And horizon three, what you see on the far transformational side is you use new technology to create new experiences. And this is what we call an innovation portfolio. And what you see here is what we do with Woolworths. So Woolworths is funding a share <clears throat> in retail innovation. And the idea of an innovation portfolio is that you have a healthy mix between predictable, low risk, uh, but potentially uh, also low return projects, and projects that are out there. But if I'm large, and if I'm not R&D intensive, I'm not Hewlett Packard, Google, or Volvo, uh, I typically don't have the internal capability to do innovation. And so what we offer is innovation as a service. And the university for the real world has the opportunity to convert its research, which is opportunity driven in many cases, to the problems that are out there. And what we try to establish with the chair in retail innovation and in airport innovation, and what we do with Rowena around the, the chair in the digital economy, is to provide research informed innovation as a service to our corporate partners. So um, we're quite active in that space, so uh, Susie will be delighted. We are very active when it comes to innovation in our curriculum. Innovation might be, in fact, one of those topics that is more cross-disciplinary than any other topic we have. Um, so what you see here goes across creative industries, where we work on, on design issues that are, that are needed in, in, in industries that rely on, on consumer experiences. 
the Gauss around the technological disruption that we now introduce to our IT students. And of course, it covers the entire entrepreneurship uh, and innovation that we see in the business school. Uh, so on the educational side, there's just plenty of content out there. Um, and um, this afternoon, I want to take you on a journey through those three items. Um, to, to craft a narrative for what we at QUT, together with our partners, could achieve. So the three items are first, revenue resilience. That means in the future, organizations, including QUT, need to worry much more about the revenue stream than the cost base. Again, it's easier to look after cost than revenue, but that's what is required. Um, second, um, I want to talk about the seven habits of a digital mind. Um, and third, I want to talk about the notion of innovation systems. So, revenue resilience. <clears throat> As I highlighted, BPM included, academics and practitioners <clears throat> have developed a track record of capturing a problem, analyzing a problem, and fixing a problem. In most cases, we do this to reduce costs to become operationally effective. And that was a large focus of, let's say, BPM research, process management research for the last 10 to 15 years. And we've done this really well. Um, and in order to become uh, effective, there are two options. One is you reduce your uh, resource base, you eliminate activities that don't add value, you reduce the variation, you replace manual labor. Uh, the Upton is doing a lot of work around frugal innovation and promotes this. Um, and of course, in the space of big data, you can see if I find further inspiration. UPS has done this really well with a system called Orion. And they save every year 95 million minutes by not turning left. Um, and so that means you simply uh, don't wait for ongoing traffic. That takes, uh, I think, the carbon emissions of 5,300 cars off the road every single year. That means you deliver 90 instead of 60 parcels every day in an organization that delivers 17 million parcels every single day. Um, and so, um, and we've replicated part of this for Woolworths, by the way. Um, the second opportunity is what we see in cloud computing, but now far beyond technological resources, that you replace capital expenses with operational expenses. Um, so Mississippi Power used this to, uh, to cope with uh, the hurricane. And DHL in Stockholm <coughs> advertises who wants to take parcels home to their neighbors because the last mile delivery is incredibly expensive. So this shows you that the big paradigm in the digital world is access, not ownership. Access, not ownership. Um, I was uh, last Wednesday at Australia Post, and that scared the hell out of them. Um, what do you mean with all these posties and these guys just crowdsource some delivery guys? Uh, that's your future competition, yeah? Um, so these opportunities where you still can be very smart and become cost um, efficient. Um, a piece of work we have done here was the Suncorp, an article in the Fin Review. And so this is a team around Asa, Marcello, uh, Mao, Suriati, where we took 35,000 claims. And there's now innovation without creativity, positive thinking, commercial claims, commercial insurance, out of the last months, you pick those that are highly successful. Let's say measured as short processing time. Um, then you go, big change in mindset, and try to work out why do these individuals and their processes outperform the rest. You can do statistical analysis. You can study process mining results and process models. And you more or less copy and paste, as a recommendation, proven practice. You find it to be in the existing assets. Uh, the consequence was what used to take up to 60 days can sometimes take only one day now. It's like innovation at your desk. I need an email attachment, and in return, I tell you what you have to do. So this is one way of becoming cost efficient. Um, that helps you if this matters. Um, but Suncorp today has a number of people working on the problem. How do I sell car insurance in the world of the driverless car? Um, so QT can be very cost effective, but if nobody wants a uh, master's degree, but your social brand on LinkedIn, which is more credible because I know who knows you, it's maybe more, more real uh, time and maybe less outed than your MBA from 10 years ago, it doesn't matter how cost efficient we are, but people won't demand a degree. It doesn't matter how efficient you are if consumers 
don't want a motor insurance anymore. And so this brings us to the topic of revenue resilience. Um, I met the CIO of EB Games and I asked them, how many people do you believe in five years will rock up, drive 20 minutes, find a car park, rock up and say, here's $50, can I get a DVD of a video game? In five years, they won't even have a DVD drive at home anymore. Uh, so revenue resilience means um, the danger that, that the future digital competition will eat into your revenue base much more uh, than in your cost base. So revenue resilience is an addition to, but instead, cost resilience. So I'll show you some examples here. Um, uh, Uber uh, is a typical example. So here are our organizations. And then just to have in mind, Uber was launched in November 2012 in Sydney. Can I quickly ask who has used Uber before? 10%. That is roughly the same figure I got at Australia Post. Um, Mia was there as well. Um, when we asked, um, when, when PricewaterhouseCoopers got asked the question, I think it was 60 to 70% who said we used Uber before. Uh, so here's an organization that goes from 0 to 100. Uh, where you can get a helicopter ride uh, or buy your Christmas trees. Um, Uber will compete with Australia Post in the future. Um, so, um, and when, when um, taxi drivers around the world went on strike, it was the best media campaign for Uber. I think the demand tripled because all those guys who've never heard about Uber heard on that day and realized do you want to hop into any kind of taxi or join someone that I trust. Uh, having in mind Uber might charge you New Year's Eve seven times the amount. So talking about deregulation, this is dynamic pricing on steroids. Uber means depending on the day or the time, you will pay a different price, uh, which is very different to what we see right now on the street. Um, some of you, uh, but most of you won't be too old for this, um, um, you remember the time when people actually used to pay for SMS? So you used to send a message and then there was a, was a fee per message. Um, it's very hard to comprehend for the younger generation, by the way. Um, uh, LinkedIn and Seek, a uh, typical example. So LinkedIn, like TripAdvisor, what they do really well, they first create a community and then a service for this community. Facebook is doing this as well. So the classical mindset is you build a product or a service and then you find customers. What these organizations do, they do it in the opposite way. And this is why I appreciate the new institute for connected communities, where the new value will be a social capital and not the service that you've got. Um, and so uh, Alistair Barros and others are replicating this for Suncorp and Bank of Queensland. Um, very long time ago, people would spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on GPS devices and cars. Um, as I said, Airbnb, light on assets, and today has got more beds than Hilton. Four years old, by the way. Yeah? Um, Facebook, um, so I never understood why anybody would pay $15,000 to a gentleman or a lady who hands over photocopies on a Saturday morning. Um, so, so once you break this sort of deregulation or regulation, um, you will see a massive shake up there as well. Um, Facebook will become a retail bank very soon. Um, so, so the digital mind of a digital native can't understand. When you transferred money, you had to go to a web page. They gave you a separate password. You had to remember BSP, and what was the other thing? An account number, just to do business with it. It didn't come to you, and you couldn't click on a face. And you had to worry about where the money goes. This is very hard to comprehend for a digital native. So that's a sort of mindset you have to, have to develop in a digital world that does not accept redundancy. The current way of automating companies comes from a life when people had no digital identity, when you were digitally nothing. And so all the money, resources, and capabilities were with organizations. And, and one outcome was that they happily replicated you. And for the first time in mankind, we give power to the people, digital power to the people. That will mean in the future, the organization will come to you, and you won't come to them. And I talk about this under the umbrella of proactive teaching in a second. Um, Airbnb, as you most likely know, offers, of course, uh, dinner experiences. Uh, we all are aware that MOOCs is coming, but we don't know what it means. But it could mean we have to build up our revenue resilience. 
Um, and some might even think in Switzerland or not um, that those kind of watches uh, are a threat to your business. Well, to bring this together, and, and some of you have seen this before, maybe the most important conceptualization of our research is this notion of innovating below or above the line. So the red line that you see here is inspired by the Kano model, developed in the 80s, the classical hygiene factor. You do something really well, and the customer will say, uh, finally, thanks. Um, they won't be delighted. So, example, DHS, one of our industry partners, they said, Michael, you won't believe, but after many, many years of work, citizens in Australia have to change their address only once. Child Support Agency, Medicare, ATO, Centrelink, guess what? Massive data integration project, couple of PhDs in this area, and guess what? You only change your address once. And I said, it's a massive step for you and a very small step for mankind. <laughs> uh, because, <laughs> because the citizen today wants to change their address only once. You solved the problem for you, but not a problem for me. Um, and so what you do on the red line, this is reactive, this is about cost resilience, and most organizations are on the bottom left corner. We do this really well, and that's a space where we are busily being busy. And because we're so busy there, we never make it to the blue line. So the blue line is really about creating experiences that are opportunity-driven. This is opportunity-driven innovation. This is what Airbnb or uh, Uber have done in the digital world. The problem is that academics give us a lot of input for below-the-line innovation and very limited guidance for above-the-line innovation. And so if it's true that innovation will consume more of your time than execution, uh, there will be a massive vacuum for systems that are organizational, technological, financial, that guide us through opportunity-driven innovation, or what we call today, revenue resilience. So what I believe is that we will have a shift from the left to the right, and then increasingly we will be inspired and look into the future. So I mentioned an insurance company that built up a dedicated cohort that tries to understand the future and its implications. If the generation Y can only think about the next half an hour, how will you ever sell a life insurance to them? This is a real problem if a large chunk of your revenue is life insurance. So you can see um, that there are massive, massive uh, threats to your revenue base if you don't build the ability to conduct foresight innovation. And if your mindset is always where I am and how do I fix this as opposed to where could I be and how do I get there? Um, example from our research, um, together with others, um, we um, develop uh, intelligence around retail of the future, um, future of the uh, retail market, and what are the uh, implications for large organizations like Woolworths. Um, if you are below the line, you react to what you currently see. If you are above the line, you react to um, insights. That also means that a, that a center of excellence on big data needs to find a way to deal with big future data. Um, and it's interesting to analyze what I've got until today. It is potentially more relevant to, to, to find scientific approaches that help us to increase the quality of data that will matter in the future. Um, so we can accelerate the way of how we react to what we see. So item number two now is if, if revenue becomes um, increasingly something that is challenged, uh, we have to find new ways of thinking. <coughs> now, from now on, you could talk about very different streams, and i just like to pick one slice, that is, what are the opportunities we have in the digital world? And I call this the digital mind. Um, so I did a Google test, and if you Google digital mind today, you see a label that provides alternative psychedelic music. <laughs> um, and so it's a bit of a uniqueness factor here. Um, so, um, digital mind. Um, digital mind means we know the digital native is by birth in a different planet. Uh, you see this if you go to the cube. Any six-year-old will run to the cube, and correct me if I'm wrong, Gavin, and play with those um, 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 interfaces. And all the CEOs we had there, they look at this, admire, and say, hey, what can I do here? Um, now, now, you can't rewire your brain. Um, but what we propose to the organizations we are working with and to researchers interested in this domain, how do we develop mindfulness? 
that guides you in a digital world. So the next picture will highlight seven <coughs> habits or traits of a digital mind, and then I'll take you through them. Um, and, and this is quickly the definition of the digital mind. So the digital mind hopefully helps you to survive in this dual world that I described earlier. Um, the digital mind that I talk about is less for the society, communities, or the individual. It is more for corporations. So how do you develop digital mindfulness in a corporation like Suncorp, like Woolworths, or like QT? Um, and it's in the mind of, of um, Daniel Kahneman, maybe the idea of slow thinking, slow innovation. You're very purposeful. You're very conscious. You do not just create an idea, you know where the idea comes from. I call this um, stand-up innovation. My dream is to take our students at the end of the semester, they can pull a scenario out of their head, and within 60 seconds, they give us three ideas. But they engineer the idea. They're not creative. They can say for every single idea, how did they engineer the idea? And that's the sort of thinking we try to inject in the future innovation professionals that come out of um, Q. <coughs> so the first layer <coughs> of the digital mind is citizen-focused. So citizens. Um, have now little mobile friends. When Wozniak was at the Business Leaders Forum, he said, in the future, this is your best friend. Why do I need all those humans? Um, Coke talks about the share of throat. Your car manufacturer talks about share of garage. People talk about share of wallet. This is about share of digital attention. How close am I to you when you look at this device? And what does it mean for QT? Second, um, those citizens will produce signals. There will be devices who do this on their behalf. The Internet of Things, the robot, the, the location-based service. Or they do this uh, purposefully. They tweet, they interact, they send out messages. And you want to collect them before anybody else can collect them. And for this, you need trust, or you need to be a very, very good digital listener. And the third component is they have digital capital. That's maybe the biggest change now that all of a sudden, our consumers come with their own data. Five years ago, bring your own device was a big problem for IT companies and IT departments. For some, still is. <coughs> Current problem is bring your own data. What do you mean? I need, I need a QT email? I need a stuff like email? I need another force of this email in my life? Why? Why can't I just bring my own data? Oh, you can't deal with this? Um, the, the next item is what happens on the corporate side. On the corporate side, it's about the digitization of assets. That means either accessing Airbnb or Uber, assets outside the organization. Digitize what I've got and commercialize idle assets or create entire new assets. And this all comes together in what I call the digital community, the social capital that you can produce. So let's start on the top left and go to the bottom right. So the first one is, I compete for digital attention. When I visited Daimler, they tried to put the internet in the car. When you go to Google, they put the car into the internet. The digital mind puts the car into the internet, and not the other way around. Um, when we had the, the uh, head of Dan Murphy here a couple of months ago, he said, my biggest worry is that our consumers run around with an Amazon Fire Phone the true one-click shopping experience. I open up my phone. My phone will recognize the bottle of wine and say, buy it. That's what they do. Dan Murphy, thank for the, for the display of products. Um, and and we, we have some interactions with uh, Brisbane Airport Corporation and Virgin around, and how do we become the trusted party that is the closest to the traveler of the future? We compete with travel agencies or Googles. So there will be the internet of, of subsets, the internet of travelers, and the question is who will be the closest to collect your digital attention? Um, so the second one is um, the digital signal. So this is about um, finding, not searching. Uh, the biggest competition for the Google search engine is the find engine. Uh, no offense, but most people don't Google the master of biofabrication. A lot of people like to understand, sorry Mia, uh, a lot of people like to understand what 3D printing can do to the healthcare sector. How do I find you proactive teaching 
instead of demand-based teaching. Um, so that means in the car industry, when you have an accident, um, there are hundreds of, of sensors. I realize you've got an accident. I most likely can estimate the sort of injury you've got. I notify the hospitals around. And in the perfect world, I can sell the whole data to someone who provides ambulance as a service. Um, Allianz can, can sense when you leave the country and start the travel insurance. And my car tells me today that I'm running out of petrol, and it takes me to the next petrol station. Um, at Suncorp, we built a live event handler. We said, hey, Michael, I bought a bike. I don't want to. Now, what are the implications for my home and content insurance? I share a live event with you. And I pick it up. So I believe that QT in the future has to listen to live events. And like your bank looks after your financial well being, and your GP looks after your medical well being, we could be the provider of choice for educational well being. And our students, after three years, trust us more than anybody else. But we lose the share of attention uh, when they get the third PDF uh, newsletter as an alumni. <laughs> um, so I'll show you one more example in that space. Has anyone seen this device? Uh, so it's a very simple device. Yes, yeah? so it's got two buttons, a microphone, um, and a, a barcode scanner. It comes from Amazon. So, so in California, they started to deliver uh, uh, food. Yeah? So what they do is they, they get very close to you. They allow you to collect digital uh, social signals during the day. And at the end of the day, you just go to your little shopping catalog. Michael, you told me you want chocolate chips. I've got three alternatives. Which one? And then they deliver. Um, again, think you're Woolworths, think you're Coats. What does it mean? But also think you're a researcher. What does it mean? And how does the BPM community of the future collect live events? Uh, and what does it mean? What sort of process do I execute? Uh, so the third one is private capital, bring your own data. So that the consumer of today wants to bring their own data when they engage with you. I come to QT, I send in a lecture, I want to press the like it button and share it with my friends. Doesn't work today, but could work in the future. Um, at KLM, I want to sit next to someone um, that, I, that I like. Um, and the fact, I, I took this picture on Wednesday, um, that I get a 5% discount and a coffee in Melbourne, it's not for me to express that I like you. I want to express this to my network. I want to utilize my network. Hey, Woolies, can you deliver food? But please send it to my friend who lives closest by. Hey, Masters, I want to buy a dishwasher, but I don't trust this 20 year old sales guy. I trust my friends. <coughs> Woolworths, can you tell me which of my friends bought this dishwasher? And so this is where corporate capital and private capital comes together. Um, and this is what we call um, the connected community, where, where um, we have an ASC linkage with the Bank of Queensland in that space. Uh, Kickstart right now, if you want to join us, by all means, let us know. This is very much about banking in a world where consumers arrive with private digital capital. Um, the next one, uh, maybe the most powerful one, is the uh, social capital. I use a very kind of tangible example, the Thermomix. Um, a device that is doing anything from uh, pumpkin soup to creme brulee and costs $2,000. Now, revenue resilience means anybody could look at this and for half the price build it in some low-cost country. Unless there's some stickiness. And that's what they call their community. Um, and so what you do is you don't just give them a device, you create a community around it. And it gives you so much protection that you can't just replicate the device. Uh, so you share recipes, like this kind of a vegetarian sausage roll, which is hard to comprehend for a German. Um, <laughs> but, but it's a notion around social capital as a competitive advantage. And this is why in the digital world, we have one YouTube, one Google search, one LinkedIn, one Pinterest, you name it. That means the bigger you are, the bigger access you have to create a social community. And then nobody can compete with you. What we see right now, anyone on this planet can create a MOOC and compete with us. In a world that thinks like this, this is not possible. Um, next example. Um, this is about access or not ownership. So the light asset model of Airbnb versus the heavy asset model of the Hilton. Um, Uber is a typical example for 50 to 20 dollars in Manhattan. From, from the south to I think 110th, they deliver. So what they do is, I've got someone who wants to take something from A to B who wants to go. And that means walking and running, cycling or driving, whatever there is. So you advertise this. Um, 
on, on Wednesday, 500 people from Australia Post get quite nervous when you show them these examples because they're asset heavy. Um, the next one, um, and maybe the idea for Australia Post, um, you still have got physical assets, and how can I use them? <clears throat> for airports, uh, having access to people becomes a unique advantage. When we all in our dual world move online, maybe access to physical people could become a competitive advantage. So what Alex Stryling and his team are doing with the airport is to think about what else can I do with people waiting for departure. In our very first journey of BPM, we did the typical let's model the process and think about how we make boarding and check-in faster, cost resilience. In the new world, we think about what do I have and what else could I do? And could QT become the core broker of mobile education when you fly? Could we subsidize your flight? Um, and if I'm a taxi company, what else can I do with 68% of idle capacity, <coughs> meaning drivers waiting for a passenger? And instead of playing Angry Birds or reading the newspaper, what can I do with people who speak 48 languages, and if I believe them, have 48 different degrees? Um, <laughs> but the digital world will mean you can broker those sort of assets um, to the outside world. And the final component, um, sorry, but one example here. Um, an example for idle assets, and now think Australia Post. So you create the mobile mailbox. You, you go shopping, you say, send it to my car, and Volvo will tell the logistics company, number plate, GPS location, color, whatever. You get a notification from the moment the delivery has occurred. Hop in your car and drive home. You might not do this for your fridge delivery, but for a lot of other items. <laughs> um, and then, so the final item is, um, instead of accessing outside resources or commercializing and digitizing uh, internal um, assets, you can create complete new assets. I give you one example, um, Sense T. So they put sensors in the soil or in the water, uh, and, and create a lot of information for oyster farmers and others in Tasmania. Uh, and what we learn from them is there's an oversupply of big data. So we think about big data is what we've got and we analyze it better. The digital mind will look at big data as an asset, and the question is, research project at QT right now, will we have an eBay for data? Could I trade data? Do companies increasingly produce data that they don't need? So they produce data so they can commercialize it. And you, as a manager, make a decision, could I find a convenient way to buy that sort of data? The sensors in your car um, that I mentioned earlier are one example. And the economic in, in, um, incentive for the car provider might be as well, besides rescuing your life, of course, um, to think about um, consumers for that sort of data. Uh, so that wraps it up. And in order to, to contextualize it, I, I, I put my creative cap on. And, and these are seven ideas what QUT would do. Could you imagine a world like Amazon Dash, where the day one you arrive at QUT, we give you the QUT device? See, in five years, your little friend won't cost $1,000 anymore. Um, could I imagine that this becomes my little trusted uh, buddy here, and it's my little QUT device? <coughs> and by pressing a certain button, it will do certain things. And knowledge will be location sensitive. Um, uh, I talked about the like it button, knowledge might be allocated to location, and proactive teaching will mean I know more about what you need to know than yourself. Uh, but you might share um, certain um, elements of your life with me. Uh, and maybe what we know about the task rabbit could become a knowledge rabbit. So today you can buy someone to mouse your lawn, it could be, become a broker between people who just need some wisdom, some knowledge. I just need for two hours a data scientist. You've got 46,000 students. Can anyone help me? Um, so that's the digital mind. And to wrap this all up, um, organizations need to have some systems that help them to capitalize on all of this. So you understand awareness, revenue resilience matters. You change your mindfulness and develop a corporate digital mind. And the third one is you need systems um, that help you to change, to innovate. So over the last 30 to 40 years, we have become optimizers of the enterprise system. But we don't have innovation systems. Um, and, and that's the space that I believe gives a massive, massive opportunity for, for researchers in, in, in business in IT land to think about how those, um, such systems could look like. Our gut feeling today is um, that maybe you have a 1 to 1,000 ratio in terms of people working there. 
If only one in 1,000 would think about tomorrow full time, not in a two hour brainstorming workshop on a Friday afternoon, uh, we would progress. And so the people I need um, above the line have those sort of traits. And we understand we can't copy and paste every individual who is busily being busy into the space of innovation systems. Uh, but what we do with many organizations we are working with is trying to understand what are evidence-based um, design templates for innovation processes and innovation governance and tools and systems that could support innovation. Um, so um, I'd like to highlight a few streams of research that are happening um, in the business school, for example, that matter here. And so you will be aware of many of them, but what I believe also innovation will do to QUT um, under the umbrella of helping organization to change in a more productive, effective, and faster way um, that, we, that we need to consolidate those pieces of expertise. Uh, whether it's the, the energy um, uh, dedicated background that, that, that Rob um, and his team bring to the table, um, whether it's uh, to understand in a, in a 24 hour on digital world, how do I ever decouple physical and digital experiences or what sort of new work models will emerge. Um, so our frame of thinking looks like this. Um, and many of you have seen this. Yeah, I don't know what I don't think down now the bottom left at the top left corner. This is the biggest challenge for organizations right now. Um, and this is the biggest problem. Um, so if all we have is demand-based learning, welcome to EQT, what would you like to study? This is, I'm here. Yeah, I know exactly what I know now and I like it, so I need more of it. Please train or educate me. And I move from here to here. My problem is, if I'm in the top left corner, someone has to pick me up there. So what we do with the Department of Human Services, we now deliver, I think every four or six weeks, a seminar where we more or less pick the content. We talk about things that you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know. This is inspiration as a service. It was not a joke. <laughs> um, and it's our organizations increasingly build up the awareness, it's like a meta-awareness now, that they don't know what they don't know. So they need to put their heart and soul into some trusted partner, like a subscription model, who keeps them up to date, who looks after their educational well-being when they are not able to articulate what they need to know. Massive, massive value proposition for QUT and our research. Um, I'll show you one example of what we do in the um, top right corner, which is the other dangerous playground. That means you do things really well, you just don't know why you do them well. Um, and so we've done this, as many of you know, with 900 bakers at Woolworths. Big data analysis. I think we had 800 variables that potentially could explain the difference between a performing baker and a non-performing baker. So you can see bakeries on such a trivial business. If you throw a big complex data analysis at it, it becomes a scientific, uh, scientifically uh, a big, big challenge. So we narrowed it down to 34 or 35 variables. You understand context. Do you sell bread and Escort or Logan? Uh, and once you understand this, you can pinpoint with evidence to the outstanding baker. Those bakers still don't know why they're better than the rest. It's like our best lectures with a high reframe score typically don't know why they're better than the rest. So you have to help them to become consciously competent, and then you can replicate this. Um, if you're the size of Woolworths, that equals a two-digit uh, million uh, growth in revenue. Uh, this is a low-hanging fruit in many organizations, um, including QUT. Um, so the, the KPI that matters in innovation systems is innovation latency. How long does it take you to overcome the I don't know what I don't know, data latency, to understand its implication for you, will QT really build a QT device, and to implement it? The longer this takes, the more you have a Kodak experience. Uh, Kodak, I think, had uh, a few years ago $2.5 billion profit. Uh, but if you downplay communities, any small Instagram can just take you out of business. You're not revenue resilient, despite the fact that you're an SAP showcase and had the most efficient business process. Cost resilience is simply not good enough. Um, so um, the process of innovation, this is now the kind of innovation value chain. This is the kind of system we have to build in the future, a system that supports you in ideation. So we have done a lot of research and developed 
patterns that semi-automatically could propose better ideas, that do environmental scanning as a service, uh, covers work around design, or, as I talked about, utilization of idle assets. Um, incubation, implementation, and operation. Now, this is not a waterfall model, and a lot of iterations in between. Um, but you could take this as a high-level value chain, like Michael Porter in the 80s. He created one value chain. Then, of course, in every company looks very different. But you have a starting point. Uh, and for us to create value chain 2.0, the innovation value chain, I think it's a massive, massive research opportunity to conceptualize and design innovation systems. So two examples, uh, Kara's work around design-led innovation. So you can see it's a 10-step process, but what people like me hate are iterations. This is not just one, two, three, and then go left or right. There's a lot of unpredictability in iteration. But I believe after 20 years of BPM research, we're now ready to target much more complex processes. And if you zoom into any of those bubbles, like one of the assumptions I have when it comes to consumer, and the way Kara's team visualizes this is in kind of um, narratives like this, what sort of system could I use? What sort of kind of tools could guide me through this process? So if I want to scale up design and innovation from a PowerPoint science for small cohorts to large scale design led innovation for someone like Woolworths, um, I can't rely on manual experience anymore. And the question is now for researchers, to what extent can I semi-automate at least parts of this process? Um, the second example is open innovation. Every quarter in this building, but the bad news is it's on the weekend, uh, we do open innovation. So last time it looked like this. Um, we had 75 people from the government wearing red shirts saying problem owner. You uh, articulated the problem on openinnovation.com.au in advance, productivity in the beef industry, um, um, health systems for Aboriginal communities, or how to fix graffiti problem on the road. And then people wearing white shirts could step up and said, here's my solution, or my idea at least. Uh, and then we broker this conversation, and the winning teams will get 12 weeks of incubation. I hope the next winning team will be based in P or Y block. So we take you from a fast um, uh, ideation process to a solid, let's gather more evidence around you and provide the sort of expertise you need for your incubation so we can mitigate the risk of innovation. So for the problem of how do I fix graffiti, you could either have like a Peter Cork mindset and think about a drone and spray paint so you don't have to block the road. Uh, or you could be headquartered in creative industries and suggest play Barry Manilow and then I'll come in the first place. <laughs> um, but the idea is, all you have is a problem. You've got no idea where the solution goes. What we do with PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, who is funding the chair digital economy uh, in the School of Management in our school, is to build innovation accelerators, tools and systems that take you through these kind of processes in a much more predictable manner. So this is the big story we have in mind. Uh, and, and Brisbane Marketing and um, Queensland Government are involved as well. Uh, but what we hope that under the umbrella of the chair and digital economy, we on the one side provide evidence and data around the digital economy. What's the digital literacy in the tourism industry, for example? We consolidate and build new curriculum, but in a very proactive manner for the guys who don't know what they don't know. And we pick massive innovation streams and try to accelerate. Um, how does this work in co-innovation? We are maybe more theory and opportunity driven. Our partners are more problem driven. We could do these two steps together. And while they appreciate building and using, we appreciate understanding. They are driven by utility. We are driven by theorizing. Uh, and that's a kind of conceptual model <laughs> where I believe we also have to innovate the way we work with industry partners. Um, so I do apologize, uh, maybe un-German, I went over time. Um, but I'd like to, like to acknowledge that a lot of people contributed to this and, and that the, the Howell High School appreciates the opportunity to share some of our projects. Thank you so much. <laughs>